Thanks for all being here on this Thursday afternoon in week seven, I think. I know it's a busy time for everybody, but I'm very delighted to be able to introduce the first talk for this academic year, sponsored by the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement and the Philosophy Department. And even more delighted to be able to introduce Eric Campbell. Um, so Eric is um, assistant professor, is that right? At the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, he got his PhD at UCSD. He works in the areas of philosophy of mind, ethics, meta-ethics, Nietzsche. I got to know Eric when I was visiting down in Washington, D.C., and I just thought his work was super interesting. I think he's one of the most interesting people working in metaethics, and I wanted to bring him up here. Um, so he will be giving us a talk today entitled Pragmatic Naturalism, a New Methodology for Metaethics and Metamorals. So, thank thank you. I slightly reduced, reduced the... <laughs> thank you. Um, as you can see, I, I sort of took the, the, the metamorals part out, thinking it was a bit too long. But you'll, no, it's not, not your fault. It's my fault. Um, so uh, I guess for the, like the past, I don't know, that's maybe 10 years or so, I've sort of been working somewhat off and on on a, uh, on a sort of large project that's sort of the, the, base, the, the heart of which is trying to cultivate or, or promote the cultivation of various forms of self-awareness in ethics and in meta-ethics. And as I was <clears throat> writing my dissertation, several, well, like almost started up about 10 years ago, well, by the time I got done with it, I was nearing the end of it, I realized the whole way I've been doing this is kind of confused. But I, I kind of let myself off the hook a little bit because what that meant was the whole way that people had been doing meta-ethics was actually confused in my, in my assessment. So I had been doing, I'd been doing something, I had a different, I had different ideas within metaethics, but the way I was framing those ideas and the way I was getting at them, I thought, you know, if I had to start this dissertation all over again, I would really have to reframe everything. Um, and so the, there's a, a certain methodology that I thought would have been much more appropriate for doing the kind of thing that I was trying to do, but I also think be more appropriate for doing just metaethics generally. And so I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about that today. Um, well, what is meta-ethics? I don't, I, I must, some of you probably know, not everybody. Well, that's actually part of what's going to be at issue uh, today. It's not going to be like a really focused, you know, if at the end of the day you think, hey, that sounds like a cool methodology, but I'm not sure it's necessarily meta-ethics. I don't, I don't really care because, I, I mean, there aren't any meta-ethicists in here. If there, were, I would, <laughs> if there were, I would fight you on that, but I don't want to, it's, I don't want you to have to think, oh, I need to, I need to make a judgment about whether this meta methodology really is meta-ethics or not. Um, let me tell you at least one idea, <clears throat> a, a fairly standard idea. In fact, this is, I, I don't know if you could get a more authoritative source. Uh, it's the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. That tells us, this is from 2012, by the way, so it's a, little, it's a, little, it's a bit dated, but it says, uh, meta-ethics is the attempt to understand the metaphysical, epistemological, semantic, and psychological presuppositions and commitments of moral thought and talk. It's OK if you don't understand what that all means. Yet you'll, you'll get a little bit of a sense of what it means going forward. Just a couple of things that it's worth pointing out uh, quickly. First of all, that actually characterizes metamorals, not metaethics. So that says moral thought. Oh, what was that? What just happened? OK, uh, so I guess there's no, is there a laser? I won't try to use it regardless. Uh, that's what I tried, to, I tried to point. I tried to point at it. It didn't point. Um, it just turned off. So that actually would characterize metamorals, whereas ethics, uh, most people, not everybody, but most people would recognize that there's a, there's a very important sense of ethics, which is broader than morality. Any, so I'm going to use the word ethics in sort of well, a sense that maybe Bernard Williams made popular, but it's been very, very old. And it's just got to do any questions about what to do, what to think, how to live, how to act, how to feel, any questions that are normative. So I'll use those terms interchangeably. Ethical questions, normative questions. That's got to do with anything, how to do, how to be, how to think, how to feel. It, any kind of reasons for action, reasons against. That's, that's all going to be encompassed in metaethics. And I think intuitively, morality is only some subset of that. And now, secondly, um, this is not an ethical enterprise. And that's going to be part of what I think is 
is a mistaken conception of metaethics. I think metaethics ought to be an ethical enterprise. And I think implicitly it actually is. I think it's actually a lot of what's going on in metaethics really is trying to vindicate certain concepts, even though that's not on the surface. Um, so, like, so you can see, if I'm just trying to understand various presuppositions and commitments, I'm not trying to evaluate them. I'm not trying to say whether they're good or bad or right or wrong. As a matter of fact, I think that is going on. And even to the, even to the extent that it isn't going on, it ought to be going on. Um, now here's, Mary? yes. So, uh, so the meta, that, that prefix generally means something like about, like about ethics. So you could ask, so I think, you know, intuitively, if we want to, if, if ethics is like, we're, if we're arguing or discussing good and bad, right and wrong, let's call that ethics. But then meta-ethics would ask questions like, what's going on when you're doing that? And one way of understanding that is, okay, what are the metaphysical presuppositions? What are the epistemological? What, are the, what do you mean when you say stealing is wrong? What's the na what is wrongness? That's a metaphysical question, and so and so on. Um, so now there's these standard approaches to meta-ethics. These are by far and away the most common approaches to meta-ethics. And I'm going to call them following uh, somebody named Hugh Price, metaphysics and semantics first. And the idea there is that, well, let's just try to directly get at these metaphysical questions. Are there moral obligations? That's an ontological question. Do they exist? What's their nature? What's the nature of a moral obligation? Uh, now, these questions are often framed, especially in the past, I don't know, several decades or so, often framed in semantic terms. So I might ask, look, we've got this concept, moral obligation. What does that refer to? So that's a semantic notion of reference. So that's a way of getting at, it's a way of framing a metaphysical question in those semantic terms. And finding reference, suppose, suppose I can find a referent of moral obligation. It refers to this, whatever this is. That, even whether or not it's necessarily meant to, or whether, that, whether or not that's on the surface, sometimes it is on the surface. But that actually plays an important role in vindicating the concepts. So just before, we, we'll, you'll see more how that works. But you might think, take God or something. If God, if the concept God refers to something, then at least to that extent, hey, I, I guess there's no, there's no inherent problem with using the concept God. Because a lot of people think God doesn't refer to anything. It's, a mis it's a, just an error. Or like, like witches or something like that. Or phlogiston, if you've heard of phlogiston. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of stuff that we think, like, or unicorn, like that. Unicorn, we think that doesn't refer to anything. It tries to refer, it might try to refer to something, but it just fails. So if it doesn't fail to refer, then to that extent, the concept, at least to that extent, the concept is in good order. And I'm going to suggest that vindicatory role that this sort of standard approach to metaethics, it actually doesn't vindicate anything, even though it often is, is assumed to. Now, one source of skepticism when it comes to morality uh, and a number of other things, there's a, there's a, there's a, a very influential way of thinking about naturalism, which we'll call metaphysical naturalism. According to metaphysical naturalism, everything that exists is part of the natural world. That's actually part of why people are, could be skeptical about God or witches, or at least the supernatural witches, because, well, they're supernatural, and nothing supernatural. There is nothing supernatural, according to a, a very, especially in, uh, within analytic metaethics, but even more broadly, you know, if you, as soon as you start talking about something that's outside the natural world, skeptical hackles are going to get raised. So that's one way. That, that's, a, that's a common uh, sort of a priori starting point for a lot of people. Now, that, that starting point motivates a certain kind of project. Well, look, if everything that exists is part of the natural world, well, what about all this stuff that doesn't really look like it's part of the natural world, like moral reasons, or in fact, like any normative reasons? They don't look like they're natural things, logical properties, modal properties, like possibilities. Where are possibilities in the world? Where are necessities in the world? Now, I'm not saying that, doesn't, that isn't meant to be a rhetorical question that's supposed to mean, oh, there's no way you could locate them. Some people try to locate them. But the, the point is, if you are starting with metaphysical naturalism, if, you, if you're committed to that, but you also think there's, there's definitely some kind of moral reasons, there's definitely some kind of ethical reasons, then, you're gonna, then you're, a certain project is going to present itself to you. How do we locate 
moral reasons, logical properties, and so on in the natural world. But if you think you can't, then that's a common motivation for something called moral error theory. Now, it's not the only motivation for moral error theory, but moral error theory is, is an accepted position. I don't mean it's accepted in the sense that uh, people accept it. <laughs> I mean it's accepted that it is a position <laughs> in metaethics. Uh, it's a very small minority position, but it's nevertheless taken seriously enough. In fact, in some ways, it's taken extremely seriously in the following sense. Lots of views in metaethics you can see, sometimes explicitly and sometimes implicitly, as a response, as a way of avoiding error theory, in, in a similar way that lots of, uh, there, there's, there's other kinds of moral skepticism other than moral error theory, but you can see a lot of what's going on in ethics as ways of avoiding skepticism, right? Now here's the most common version of moral error theory. Moral concepts, so the concept of moral obligation, duty, um, per permissibility, impermissibility, re responsibility even, all, even just the concept of a, of a moral reason itself, a moral truth, moral fact, all that stuff, all those concepts presuppose categorical reasons or requirements. Now what does that mean? That term, and, and by the way, that, that's, just, that's one way of framing the basic idea in terms of categorical reasons. That term comes from Kant, and it's set in opposition to hypothetical reasons. Hypothetical reasons are reasons that depend on some kind of desire or concern or goal that you have. So, you know, I, I had the goal of getting here in time to give this talk, and given that goal, I needed to leave. I had, there was a requirement. You had better leave by three. But if I didn't have the goal of being here, then that reason for leaving by three goes away. I don't, there's no requirement. There's nothing normative. You don't have to leave by three if you don't have the goal of getting somewhere. Categorical reasons are reasons or requirements that don't have that kind of dependence. And so the, the very, according to this premise, the very concept of a moral reason to do something is one that it doesn't go away just because you don't have some kind of concern or goal. So a moral obligation not to steal, for example, you still have a reason not to steal. In fact, according to some people's way of thinking, including Kant, you have an overriding reason not to steal, regardless of what your own concerns and, or interests or, ad, or values are, all right? So that's, that's a semantic premise or a conceptual premise, if you like, that it's built into the very idea of morality, that there's these kinds of reasons or requirements. But, the, but there ain't no reasons or requirements like that. That's the second premise a metaphysical, or we're not justified in believing in them. And part of, it's not the only way to argue for this premise, but a common as part of arguing for this premise is to say, you know, requirements that are somehow just floating totally free of any of your actual concerns, those are just spooky. Those, those would have to be some kind of otherworldly, non-natural kinds of entities. And so metaphysical naturalism plays a role in in uh, motivating this error theoretic conclusion. And the conclusion is, well, all moral claims are false then. Just like, it's, it's, it's modeled really on an argument for atheism. It's the same idea. Religious concepts presuppose some kind of supernatural creator. There ain't no supernatural creator, therefore all these claims are false. That's the basic, basic logic. Now, if you accept an error theory, or in fact, even if you think an error theory is sufficiently plausible, Something called the, the now what question shows up. Well, if, that's, if moral area theory is true, now what? What are, you, what are we going to do? Well, what I want to point out, first of all, point out is that all error theorists acknowledge that that question is left wide open by their error theories. When they make an error theory, when they, when they present an error theory, they're not, in and of itself, not trying to say anything negative about moral discourse. They're just trying to say the claims that are made in the discourse are not true, or they're not justified. Is it just like you could imagine with religious discourse, we might think, okay, all these claims are technically false, but geez, suppose the whole society was just built <laughs> on religious discourse, it's not obvious that you should just immediately stop, right, with all the religious discourse. So there's a certain kind of uh, response, it's fictional, we'll talk more about these, I'm just gonna list them very briefly. Fictionalism says we should just pretend to believe moral judgments. And I'll tell you why soon enough. Now, we shouldn't believe them because they're wrong, because they're false. And you know you shouldn't believe false things. And there's reasons given for that. 
Another one is, hey, maybe we should just get rid of moral discourse. Now, that's partly because all the claims are false or unjustified. I'm just going to say false, uh, and that'll mean false or unjustified. Um, but abolitionists also think there's something the matter with moral discourse beyond the claims being false. They think it's no good. And I'll tell you a little more about why they think that. And then conservationists are really only one of these that I know of. And the basic idea there is just like, ah, just keep on keeping on. Don't worry about it. If they're all false, if they're all unjustified, it really isn't that big of a deal in and of itself. Who, really, who cares? And you might think, you know, maybe you think I think that's silly. I don't think that's necessarily silly. I just think the whole way of framing this problem, the whole way of, the whole way of getting to where we've gotten, that's what I think the problem is, not, not you know, let's say conservationism or something like that. And you'll, of course, you'll see what I mean as we go on. So now, the now what question is really, now we're entering necessarily, and by anybody's acknowledgment, now we're entering into conceptual ethics. Now what's that? Well, generally speaking, normative and evaluative questions, and ethical questions, about concept usage. So, for example, moral obligation, that concept. Is that a good one? Is it a good one maybe for certain people but not other people? Maybe in certain contexts and not other ones? Just as an example, you're asking about the ethics of concept usage. Now, why would you do that? Why, would, why is conceptual ethics interesting or important? Well, as I think you already can tell, it's, I don't think it's interesting and important because maybe error theory is true. That's the way that meta-ethicists, in fact, the only way that meta-ethicists acknowledge, it's widely acknowledged that an error theory is going to lead to questions in conceptual ethics. But those questions in conceptual ethics are not questions in meta-ethics, as it's ordinarily thought of. In fact, unfortunately, David Plunkett in the philosophy department here, he's not here, but he's a leading figure in conceptual ethics, uh, and he's also a meta-ethicist, and he thinks that meta-ethics and conceptual ethics are completely separate. There is no overlap between meta-ethics and conceptual ethics. And I think, on the other hand, that conceptual ethics ought to be a central part of meta-ethics. And in fact, it already is, even though we don't really acknowledge it. Um, now, I think the reason why, and, I th and David would agree with me here, that um, folk concepts, and by the way, the, the concepts that we use are all folk concepts, basically, in ethics, concept of moral obligation, justice. They're all hundreds or even thousands of years old. These are historical products, at least some of which are likely created or maintained by questionable forces of selection. I don't, for me, I wouldn't say natural selection. There are people who think that certain concepts are the product of natural selection. I don't think bi biological selection. I don't think that's plausible. But cultural selection, yeah. Um, and I think that's especially plausible when uh, an ideology. And it's especially plausible, I think, when you're talking about concepts that pretty clearly serve some kind of function of social control or coordination. Like, it wouldn't, shouldn't be too shocking to us if uh, some, some racial, gender, uh, religious, or moral concepts are the way they are through, as, as a function, at least to some extent, of ideology and, and, uh, and other maybe forces of selection that are not normative in the sense that the forces of selection are not, they're not trying to select for good stuff. <laughs> they're trying to select for something else that may not be good. So pragmatic naturalism, that's the methodology that I'm advocating, uh, whether or not you think it's part of meta-ethics, but I think it is, should be. The, there's really, there's two steps. The first step is to seek these natural, the naturalism, the naturalism part is that we're seeking naturalistic explanations, functional explanations, or what's well called use explanations, of problematic or otherwise interesting concepts. So instead of asking, what does the concept moral obligation refer to? That's a standard meta-ethical approach. I'm asking, what's the function of that concept? And that, as we're going to see, I think, can come quite apart from a semantic thesis about what the concept refers to. Um, and then you just use those explanations and by the way, the function could be, it could be the function that the concept was evolved or developed to serve, but it could also just be what are we doing with it now, whether or not it was developed or evolved for that purpose. So you could put, you know, what's it for, what's it good for? What's it, what's it, what are we using it to do at whatever level of analysis? Then you use those explanations to get leverage on questions in conceptual ethics. So if you have a sense of what we're doing with the concept, as distinct from what the concept means or what it refers to, what, what are we doing with it? 
that is very valuable information when you're asking questions about, OK, well, should, should we keep the concept? Do we want a concept that does that? And if we do, maybe a different concept could do it a little better. Maybe we could revise the concept. If we don't want something playing that role at all, maybe we just abandon the concept. Maybe we should bring in some other concept or something like that. But the question, the point is, knowing what we're doing with the thing is very important information when we want to know whether we should keep doing it in that way or in some different way. And there's no error theory required here. There's nothing about semantics in there. And an error theory, as it's universally understood, has some kind of conceptual semantic premise. I'm not saying anything about the semantics. I'm, in fact, I'm pointedly leaving them aside, because I think, as, we'll, as I'll try to show you, I think they end up being quite confusing. Now, the, I've already talk, I talked about the now what question. And the now what question, the way it's framed, is, is sort of bound up with error theory. It's, if error theory is true, now what? And that's, I'm gonna, so that's a different question. It's related. It's a related question, but it's a different question than, than what I'm calling Nietzsche's question. Nietzsche said, this is the gay science, said, look, the value of the injunction, thou shalt. And what he means by that, by the way, he's doing some conceptual ethics already himself here. And I, I wanted to have another quote where he told us why we should do conceptual ethics, but you know, it's already too long. Um, but he, he's using this phrase, or this term, thou shalt, as, so he knew about categorical imperatives and categorical reasons, but he thought there's something deeper and more fundamental going on um, that the notion of categorical imperative or categorical reason, that's a precisification or a conceptualization of something, of some anthropological phenomenon that he wanted to point to without infusing it already with a certain conceptualization of what that phenomenon was. And this, this, he uses this notion of thou shalt to just point to this sense that we have, which is central to moral discourse, he thought, but not only moral discourse, maybe, that there's certain things that we just have to do, regardless of whether or not those things comport or conform to our own values. And he said, all right, well, that, the value of that injunction, that thou shalt do certain things, is fundamentally different from and independent of whatever weeds of error, whatever beliefs that may have grown up around that sensibility. There may be beliefs, there may be systematic beliefs that have grown up around that sensibility, and those beliefs may be false. They may not be as systematic as all that, but his interest was, in this, in this passage at least, his interest is, um, what's the value of that? And it's independent of whatever these false beliefs might be. So he says, no one until now, and when he says until now, he means himself, um, 150 years ago-ish, nobody's examined the value of that, what he called the most famous of all medicines, morality. And in this context, he means other things by morality in different contexts, but in this context, he's talking about this injunction, thou shalt. So look, for once, we've got to question it. That's, that's uh, precisely that is our task. And that's what I'm going to suggest. Metamorals, in particular, metamorals ought to be doing that, ought to be at least a central aspect of metamorals ought to be investigating the value of moral concepts, and in this feature of moral concepts in particular. And that is something that only, first of all, only error theorists do at all, because it, from, a meta, from the standard meta-ethical point of view, you don't even get to this question with, unless you go through error theory. And then even then, conservationism doesn't take that question up. Conservationism doesn't have a long defense of the value of moral discourse. It just says, hey, the fact that the beliefs are false, so what? There's like two pages of Jonas Olson's book that are devoted to conservationism. It's, you, you just take the value of moral discourse for granted, essentially, and say, OK, it's false belief. Who cares? Um, but there, are, there has been some defense of the value of moral discourse, moral fictionalism being the most sustained defense. And uh, Richard Joyce says, as I already told you, we should pretend to believe in moral judgments. We should, we should pretend to believe moral judgments because they have value as a commitment device or a commitment strategy. And the basic idea there is that the belief that there are certain things that you just have to do regardless of whether you want to or care about it is good for stabilizing intentions against preference switching. So we humans, and in fact all vertebrates, have a pretty systematic tendency to switch our preferences over time as certain temptations get closer in time, get more available. You know, the, the, the preference for not uh, partying uh, 
or not stuffing your face or whatever it might be, switches. Not cheating on your spouse, maybe. I prefer the long-term benefits of staying in this relationship. But when various temptations or stealing something, the various temptations become more immediately available, we have a real tough time a lot of times not switching preferences and then regretting it. And so Joyce says, and by the way, this is the, the, the most sustained defense of the value of moral discourse, of, and this he's specifically talking about, the thou shalt feature of moral discourse, takes up eight pages of a book. That's, that's, the, that's the most sustained defense we've got. Um, and it's good for avoiding punishment. Like if, you, if, you're, if you don't have these commitment strategies, you're more likely to steal, cheat, and so on, and more likely to suffer. So that's, that's what's good about them. So we should pretend to believe them for that reason. But the thing is, he didn't consider any of the downsides of those strategies. It was all just upside. And so a few years ago, okay, I guess five, five and a half years ago at this point, I published a paper called Breakdown of Moral Judgment, where I argued that that committing function is, you're right, that committing, and he's not the only one to argue for this. Uh, a number of people have thought that the sort of attitude independent feature of moral discourse has this basic committing function. But I argued, and I'm not, this is not the subject of the talk today, um, but I argued that that committing function comes with very serious and unrecognized risks including, especially, the unwitting violation of our own deepest values. And like I said, this is not the time. I'm not going to try to convince you of that now. You can ask about it and question. But just to give you a sense of how that might happen, it shouldn't be too shocking if a mode of thought and discourse that says certain things you have to do, there are a number of things, in fact, all the moral things, you have to do them whether or not they comport with your values. That shouldn't be shocking if you end up being obligated to do things that are against your values. So it shouldn't be terribly shocking if this resulted from a moral discourse. And you can imagine quite similar critiques of religious discourse, couldn't you? You're probably already familiar with some, maybe. Um, God commands you to kill. Didn't, he didn't, it's not whether you, whether you want to kill isn't the question. God said kill. And morality sometimes says kill, too. Uh, I'm not saying killing is always wrong. I'm just giving you an analogy. Um, so I just want to get a couple of quick theses on the board. One, commitment. That's, that's just me agreeing with Joyce and a number of other people that the thou shalt in moral discourse functions to commit us to certain ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. And then the more original uh, contribution was this thesis deflection, which says uh, that this committing function operates, uh, an important part of how the committing function works is by deflecting attention and therefore awareness from the motivations that, in fact, generate moral judgments. Um, and you can you imagine how divine command would have essentially the same function. God wills it. You, you might think, yeah, it's not really God willing it, though, is it? It's you. But you're just saying God wills it. And that, by the way, that goes whether there's God or not. You can have all kinds of people talking about what God wills. God wills that we go kill the infidels or whatever it might be. Um, that's God paradigmatically has a will that's independent of your own and authoritative over your own. And so, but really, moral discourse, especially our Judeo-Christian moral discourse, it just comes right out of that tradition. It's, it's a legalistic framework, basically, a divine law, but with God stripped out. Uh, and I argue that those theses, those two theses together, support the most common and central abolitionist critique of moral discourse. And that is what I, there's a, there's a well, I call them critiques from self-awareness because the most common kind of critique of moral discourse, one that really runs through a number of quite different kinds of critiques otherwise, is that moral discourse does promote self-ignorance, especially ignorance of your own motives. I would also say ignorance of your own values and promote some kind of bad faith, hypocrisy, something like that. That's not to say that everybody, including probably the majority of people in this room, who are you know, sincere committed users of moral discourse, that you're all a bunch of hypocrites and acting in bad faith, any more than it's saying this, that about religious people. It's instead pointing out there's a, a, a dangerous and very real tendency for a certain kind of discourse and way of thinking to generate very serious problems, even though you know, if, in a world where everybody's religious, you might say, hey, those people over there, boy, they're super like, hypocritical or acting in bad faith. But it would take 
a perspective from outside of all that to say, well, really, part of the problem is just the whole the religious framework itself. I'm not saying you have to agree with that. I'm just trying to get you to understand how the, how the idea works. And these are some related things that moral discourse promotes exacerbation of conflict, groupthink, slavishness to a certain conception of value, uh, and violation of one's own values. And that's, there are some uh, authors who have made arguments like this. Now, the thing is that all of these critiques, with me, I would say the exception of Nietzsche, Nietzsche is going to be the exception in so many different ways. Um, they're all predicated on error theory. Everybody arguing this explicitly says, first, let me show you that error theory is true. Then the now what question arises. And then if I'm an abolitionist, then I say, and moral discourse is also bad in these ways. But what's happened as a consequence of that is that by their own lights, like they completely would accept, they, they don't, they don't, these abolitionists don't think otherwise. If you could rightly reject their error theory, then the rest of what comes after it is just off the table already. It's, they're predicated on error theory. And I think that has been very, very bad, from, especially from the perspective of somebody who thinks that these critiques are on the right track. So I think these, these abolitionists treat error theory as a bridge to the now what question, or Nietzsche's question. But really, it's a moat. It's really an obstacle, because error theory actually, in my judgment, isn't very plausible. I don't think it's right. I, and, and even more importantly, almost the vast majority of metaethicists don't think it's right either. And I'm going to show you just a couple of different kinds of examples of uh, theories, metaethical theories, that are not only consistent with those abolitionist critiques from self-awareness, but actually support them. But nobody has any idea, because nobody's thinking about it this way. Nobody's asking, what's the value of moral discourse, unless you're an error theorist. Instead, people are asking, what does moral fact refer to? And can I locate that in the natural world? And if I can, then I'm not even, then Nietzsche's question isn't even arising. And that's all confused <laughs> in my assessment. So I'm going to show you. Uh, the, pretty much the rest of the, of the discussion is going to be a couple of examples of how um, pragmatic naturalism is going to help reveal that, and, whereas these standard metaethical me methodologies obscure it. So one way to vindicate moral discourse or to attempt to vindicate moral discourse by, um, by rejecting error theory is there's a very large class of views, in fact, some of which are even called realist views, confusingly. But really, they're a kind of naturalistic relativism. And the core idea here is that you reject that semantic premise. You, so you have a, first of all, the, the naturalism is a kind of metaphysical naturalism. It's fine. It thinks that uh, moral concepts, they don't presuppose or try to refer to any kind of non-naturalistic kind of thing. Any, and not and the, and not a categorical excuse me not a categorical reason either that's the relativism part the relative to some kind of human attitude or goal or concern and given that these judgments are relative to some kind of human concern sometimes they're going to be true maybe very often true and of course as soon as you get that you've beaten error theory if any moral judgments are true error theory is done right especially if lots of them are true now, I'm going to give you, a, in some ways, a very extreme example of this. Um, the general point I'm going to make here, I think, applies to all views like that. But it's going to be especially striking in this particular case. According to Jesse Prinz, moral claims just refer to moral sentiments. And who could doubt that moral sentiments exist? Nobody's doubting that. Moral sentiments are just dispositions to feel some way or another um, with certain kinds of emotions. Now, he has an, a causal account of reference. It doesn't, you don't have to really understand what this means, but just for those of you who are interested, the idea is the thing that causes the judgment is what the judgment refers to. Do you need to think that's plausible or even really understand it? No. You definitely don't need to think it's plausible because the point is, so what? My point is, suppose it's true. Suppose it's the case that the things that cause the judgments are also the semantic referent of the judgment. And therefore, there's going to be lots and lots of true moral judgments. In fact, the judgment interracial marriage is wrong. It's true, provided that the person who says it 
has a sentiment of disapprobation toward interracial marriage. And likewise, interracial marriage is our highest duty, provided that the person who says it has the relevant sentiment. So there's going to be, and Prince is completely acknowledges this, I mean, the vast majority of moral judgments are true. The only time moral judgments aren't true is when you don't have the sentiment, when, you, when you're pretending to have a certain kind of sentiment. That's pretty much it. Now, um, so, you know, two diametrically opposed moral judgments can easily both be true on this account. Well, error theory is done. And yet, um, intuitively, we're not really vindicating moral discourse. Why? Well, on Prince's view, moral truths are just as abundant as they are worthless. They're all over the place all the time, and they're worth what you'd expect something to be that's all over the place all the time, or even less than that, actually, because air is all over the place all the time, and it's super valuable. Um, but the crucial thing to see here is that the concept of moral truth, if we accepted that semantic account, the concept of moral truth simply could not serve what seems to be something central to its function. The concept of moral truth has a function, very plausibly, of guiding thought and action and sentiments, in fact, right? If you have a sentiment and somebody says, if you have a sentiment, let's say you're opposed to interracial marriage, and then somebody says, well, it's a moral truth that interracial marriage is perfectly fine, the, that's supposed to function to adjust your sentiment so you don't disapprove of it anymore. But if we accept this account of moral truth, just whatever I say is true, as long as I have the relevant sentiment, then we would just have to ask, okay, well, what should the moral truth be? And then that would even just be weird, because why won't we just ask what our sentiment should be? <laughs> We're just getting confused, I think. Uh, and I think also uh, no natural, this, this is actually somewhat widely accepted, pretty widely accepted. I'm not sure how wide. I think most people would acknowledge that. At a minimum, acknowledge there's a very serious challenge here. I think no naturalistic account can accommodate the categorical or really even or the inherently normative character of morality. And this goes back at least to Hume, who told us that you can't ever derive an ought from an is. No matter what naturalistic state of affairs I describe to you, it'll never follow from that naturalistic state of affairs that it's good or that you should pursue it or anything like that. So any attempt to try to be a metaphysical naturalist and to accommodate normativity to metaphysical naturalism, I think, is, I personally think is doomed to fail. And this is an extreme example of that. There's lots of other examples that are not so strikingly obvious, um, but they're nevertheless the case. Now, Prinz is, is a total relativist, um, and he tells us, he, and, he's, and he's at least to this extent Nietzschean, he's like, look, We've got to constantly remind ourselves that our values are not reflections of an absolute truth. Morals are inculcated, as Nietzsche would say, um, by power struggles and happenstance. Reminding ourselves of the deep contingency of morality, of moral truth. In other words, the deep contingency of our moral sentiments. These are our moral sentiments themselves are highly contingent to a large extent by the of, by the kinds of cultures we've grown up in, which themselves are the function of uh, long historical. Pro processes. Reminding ourselves of this deep contingency is just a first step. We've also got to subject our values, including those we treasure, and be thinking very specifically of moral values here, to rigorous reconsideration. Now, I think that's great. And he, as he, he calls that, he describes that as a, that's going to require hard labor, and I could not agree more. But why moral discourse? In fact, I think an excellent way to undermine that entire project is just to keep referring to your contingent moralized sentiments in terms of moral truths, and obligations, duties, responsibilities, and the like. There's no plausible reason why a project like, like this one should take place using concepts of moral obligation and moral truth and moral duty and so on. That I would, plausibly, those... Um, concepts, even by Prince's own lights, and I was tempted to sort of beat this over the head a little bit more, but by Prince's own lights, those kind of concepts plausibly work 
precisely to prevent a rigorous reconsideration. The, very, the idea that the way you feel now is reflecting a moral truth inhibits you reconsidering the way you feel right now, to, at least very often. So I think we need, only hard, we need not just hard labor, but better tools. We sh the idea that we should continue using these tools at least is an open question, I think, um, pretty plausible. So what about, there's this one other, uh, one other very different kind of way for rejecting error theory and vindicating moral discourse. And the idea here, I'm going to tell you what expressivism is in a second, but before that, the idea, I'm going to put it a couple of different ways. We're going to start as expressivists and then mimic normative realism. Now, realism, that's one of the many ways of referring to this basic idea of categorical reasons. The idea, realism is like mind independence. So realism, in the way that they are using it, the way that quasi-realists use realism is they mean normative facts that are totally independent of your actual attitudes. All right? I'm going to skip that quote. So expressivism. If we're starting as expressivism, what are we, as expressivists, what are we starting as? Well, the basic idea is a certain kind of explanatory strategy. You're going to explain moral judgments and normative judgments more generally as expressions of practical attitudes or desire-like attitudes. Desire-like meaning if you, have, if you have what you ordinarily think of as a belief and you perceive the world doesn't match the content of your belief, what do you do? You change the belief, right? Does that make sense? Whereas if you have a desire and you see that the state of the world doesn't match the content of your desire, do you change your desire? No. The whole point of a desire is you try to change the world to bring it in line with the way you want it to be. That's just the nature of a desire. So that's, that's the core idea here, is that these moral judgments are expressing certain kinds of practical attitudes, desire-like attitudes. So stealing is wrong, for example, expresses some kind of disapproval towards stealing, right? And that's, that's just what it does. It's like, it doesn't say some proposition and also express disapproval. It just is expressing disapproval. Now, that seems, has seemed for a long time to a lot of people, like that's got to entail some kind of relativism or error theory. Why relativism? Well, how, how could moral facts be independent of our attitudes if moral judgments just are expressions of our attitudes? So it's, moral judgments are simply being explained in terms of the expression of attitudes, so how could moral facts be independent of the attitudes? That's one problem that quasi-realists want to solve, um, especially as quasi-realism has developed over time. And it used to be that they would kind of say, well, they're not. They would try to really not be realist. But over time, they're like, OK, we're just going to go full on and mimic realism as much as we conceivably can. Um, and also, so again, expressivism kind of started out as what's called non-cognitivism, which is saying that moral judgments are neither true nor false. And that avoids certain kind of problems. But then again, boy, you might as well be an error theorist. Because people definitely think moral claims are true. It's the idea that a moral claim at least could be true is so bound up in moral discourse that if you think they can't be true or false, what, what, how is that better than error theory, really? So they don't want error theory, and they don't want non-cognitivism anymore either. They want that moral judgments can be true. And even attitude independent. That's, that's a lot to, to do if you're starting from where they're starting. Um, and one of the really important tools that they've used, especially Simon Blackburn has used to try, to try to get this project to work, is semantic deflationism. And this may sound quite wrong to you, as it often does when people first hear it, but just bear with me for a second. I'm, and I'm not, it's okay. If, it's really going to be okay even if you don't either, even if you don't totally get it. But it's worth putting on the board. The idea here is to re you reject the idea that a sentence is true because it corresponds to how the world is. That's a very intuitive idea, that a sentence is true like grass is green. Why, why is that sentence true? Well, because grass is green, because it corresponds to how the world actually is. Um, so deflationists don't think that's what explains the truth of a sentence. Instead, for the predicate true, that functions to express agreement with a certain proposition. And false functions to express disagreement. 
So, I mean, I agree that grass is green, so I think that sentence is true, right? But I don't think that the, it's, the idea is that the state of the world doesn't, st states of the world don't explain why sentences are true. So, now why is that important? Well, take the sentence dealing is wrong. That's going to mean the same thing as st the sentence stealing is wrong is true. So this is part of what motivates deflationism, is just this idea that you can always move between any proposition P and saying that proposition P is true. I can say grass is green, or I can say the sentence grass is green is true. And I've just said the same thing. <laughs> it sounds like maybe I said different things, but really, according to deflationism, you haven't said anything really different in those two cases. Now, why is that important? You'll see more, but the crucial thing just for now is to notice that well, if those two things mean the same thing, then the second one is a normative judgment, because the first one certainly is, right? Stealing is wrong is definitely an ethical judgment. <laughs> and so the sentence, if I say this, the sentence stealing is wrong is true, I've just said stealing is wrong in different language. So, they, and given that I'm an expressivist, this, that bottom sentence is also expressing a practical attitude. They both express practical attitudes, in fact, the very same practical attitude. So I'm calling this uh, sort of the normative turn. And the idea here is that, um, well, I interpreted that last sentence as a, as a normative sentence. This, if I say the sentence stealing is wrong is true, that's a normative claim. In fact, the same claim as stealing is wrong. Now, what about realism? How do I get to be a realist if I'm an expressivist? And remember, keep in mind, realist is what Nietzsche had in mind by thou shalt, is how do I get attitude-independent normative truths if normative judgments just are expressions of attitudes? Well, I'm going to interpret belief about the nature of normativity as itself a normative belief, expressing a practical attitude. So for example, belief in realism. I'm going to explain that in terms, if I'm an expressivist, and this both uh, Alan Gibbard and Simon Blackburn have done this in their different ways. I'm going to explain belief in realism, or sometimes may objective moral truths, in terms of the possession of certain kinds of practical attitudes, but specifically practical attitudes aimed at stabilizing other practical attitudes, so basically as commitment devices. So for example, saying that the wrongness of kicking dogs for fun, if I say, you know, the wrongness of kicking dogs for fun is totally independent of anybody's attitudes about kicking dogs for fun, including my own. Um, Alan Gibbard tells us, well, look, that's just, you're just expressing a commitment to not kick dogs for fun and to condemn kicking dogs for fun, even in circumstances that might happen in the future where you're disposed to approve of kicking dogs for fun, or maybe you're disposed to kick a dog for fun, or maybe you're not disposed to condemn it. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of second-order practical belief in realism is a second-order practical attitude aimed at stabilizing certain first-order practical attitudes. So we can sort of see how this quasi-realist master argument goes. The idea is the following. And then we're going to try to defeat error theory and legitimize moral discourse. According to error theory, beliefs about the nature of normativity are not themselves normative beliefs. So if I'm an error theorist, I think, Look, people believe that there are these attitude-independent reasons, but that belief itself is not a normative belief. It's just a belief about the nature of normativity. So according to error theory, these are not normative beliefs. Well, yeah, they are, according to quasi-realists. They are normative beliefs. Well, in that case, error theory is just confused. Error theory thinks these beliefs are not normative, but really they are. They're, and in fact, they're just expressions of practical attitudes. And therefore, According to Simon Blackburn, there's nothing illegitimate in our ordinary practice and thought, and he specifically means moral practice and thought. The respects in which we talk as if there are, for, for instance, moral facts, are legitimate. Why are, they, why are they legitimate? Because error theory is false. But that's just confused. That whole line of thinking is confused. I should say that no quasi-realist has actually laid that argument out, but that is, <laughs> that is how it actually works. Because if you actually laid it out like that, it would be more obvious that it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, look, showing that a apparently non-normative metaphysical beliefs about the nature of normativity, if you show that those apparently non-normative beliefs are actually normative, that doesn't suggest that they're legitimate. 
Instead, it suggests that those beliefs, if they're going to be defended at all, would have to be defended on normative grounds. If it's a normative belief, how do you defend a normative belief? With normative arguments. It doesn't just become legitimate <laughs> because it's normative, right? Uh, any more than slavery is great. If I tell you that that's, if I'm expressing a practical attitude, does that mean it's fine? No, you'd have to, I'd, have to evaluate, I'd have to defend it on normative grounds. It doesn't become legitimate automatically. Um, and quasi-realists just have not engaged with, at all, with any normative arguments against realist moral discourse. And the reason they haven't is because they, like everybody else literally, almost, um, just assumes that if you defeat error theory, then all those abolitionist normative arguments are just off the table. But they're not off the table at all. In fact, it's strictly entailed by the interpretation of realism here that it's a normative belief. That just means you have to defend it on normative grounds if you're going to defend it at all. And abolitionists have lots of normative arguments against moral discourse. Unfortunately, they've predicated them on an error theory. So nobody pays any attention to them because nobody believes error theory. But you don't need to believe error theory. So I say that quasi-realists have worked so hard to earn the right to talk. Like, that's one of the ways quasi-realism quasi has been framed, is we're going to earn the right to talk like realists. Um, well, I guess, you know, I have the right to eat my own poop. But <laughs> should I eat my own poop? And I'm like, well, let's at least have that conversation. You know? You've heard the right to talk like realists. You've been trying to do that so much that you haven't wondered whether, what's the value of talking like a realist? Um, What's the value of moral discourse, realism? And by the way, they see realism as tightly bound up with moral discourse itself. And you can tell that they do, because that's why they work so hard to talk like realists. <laughs> because they believe, they have accepted their criticism. Look, if you can't deliver realism, then you're basically an error theorist. And they don't want to be an error theorist, so they're trying super hard to say everything that realists say. But they haven't stepped back and asked, well, what's the, they haven't asked Nietzsche's question. What's the value of this? What are we doing this for? Um, so if we're aware of these commitments, and I just showed you how Gibbard thinks of belief in realism basically as a kind of commitment strategy. It's a second order, expressing a second order attitude aimed at stabilizing first order intentions. Why, not just let, why can't we just talk in terms of those attitudes then? Why can't we just say, I really think kicking dogs for fun sucks. I think that's a cowardly thing to do, or whatever you might, whatever kind of, however you feel about it. And, and you know, it's hard to imagine a case in which I'm, that's not what I'm ever tempted by, kicking dogs for fun. But I'm tempted by other things. So it's worth both individually and collectively trying to figure out how do we structure our, our psychologies and our societies to deal with this problem of all kinds of preference switching, which is the whole point of a commitment strategy, is to avoid certain kinds of preference switching. At least that's the main point. Why can't we just talk in terms of our attitudes and sentiments? Why do we have to talk in terms of attitude-independent moral facts? In fact, it just seems to be confusing everything at best. Um, that thesis deflection explains why we're not aware. That thesis deflection that I'm not arguing for it here directly, but I'm arguing for it a little bit indirectly. That all these people, Prince, I didn't tell you why Prince thinks this, but he does. Um, Joyce, Prince, a number of other theories, including people who aren't even meta-ethicists, just people investigating moral discourse. This commitment thesis is quite widespread. But nobody, or essentially, nobody thinks that that's what I'm doing when I say that it's a moral fact, is expressing a certain kind of commitment. Well, deflection, that deflection of attention thesis explains why you're not aware of it. It doesn't, it doesn't work so well if you're aware of it. We can talk about that uh, later if you want. How are we on time? Do I need to be done? A couple minutes? OK. So I mean, I'll tell you quick, uh, pretty quickly then why, why I think expressivists should, should embrace deflection. Well. First of all, that would explain why the vast majority of non-quasi-realists, just straight-up realists, don't accept expressivist explanations. So like Terence Cuneo is a just straight-up realist. He says these expressivist interpretations of what he's saying 
When I, if I'm Terrence, I put my Terrence Caneo hat on, and I say, there are moral facts that require us to behave in certain ways regardless of whatever our attitudes are, and an expressivist says, well, you're expressing a certain kind of practical attitude. Cuneo says, that's super uncharitable. No, I'm not. Now, I think expressivists need to make a decision. I think they should either accept that those are really uncharitable interpretations, or they could have, um, I'm trying to want a point, uh, they could appeal to a non-ad hoc explanation for why it wouldn't seem that way to realists. Because the way these concepts have developed, the way the thinking works, is that you're not supposed to realize you're doing that. Now, I'm not saying they would be necessarily right, but I'm saying they, they should embrace deflection as a concomitant to the commitment thesis that they already essentially accept. It's a non-ad hoc. Another, it would explain this sumptuous rhetoric. So Gibbard says, look, suppose somebody says, it's a normative fact out there, independent of us, that kicking dogs for fun is wrong. He says, well, that, look, that turns out to be internal to normative thinking. And I already kind of told you what that meant, right? That is actually a part of normative discourse. It's not a claim about normative discourse from outside normative discourse. It's internal to normative discourse. But you know, it's just kind of arrayed in sumptuous rhetoric. Well, sumptuous is one word for it. I would say deflecting. Misleading would be a better term than sumptuous. It's super misleading rhetoric. It's, if I'm, especially when you combine it with the fact that actual realists don't think it is internal. If I'm, if I'm a realist, I'm not, well, sorry, I should say a lot of realists. Some realists do think it's internal, but they're not expressivists. But they, it's, anyway, I, don't, I can't get into that. Um, some realists do think it's a normative claim, but they're not expressivists. Um, so, you know, you might, it wouldn't be hard at all to come up with an expressivist friendly abolitionism. In fact, I have a paper arguing that for the kind of expressivist abolition, which is not to say that I'm committed to expressivism. It's just to say, hey, if you are committed to expressivism, abolitionism looks pretty good. But nobody's even aware of it as a possibility because, because there's no error theory. And you have to have error theory to have abolitionism. But you don't have to have error theory at all. And by the way, abolitionism, I should say, in my mouth, doesn't mean everybody abolish moral. It just, it just is a, it's a, there's a tradition where you offer these sort of systematic critiques of moral discourse. I'm not saying everybody ought to abolish it. Um, I'm not even saying it's all bad. In fact, the whole commitment thesis explains why there's a lot of value in it, just like I think there's a lot of value in religious discourse, a great deal of value. Nevertheless, here's a, just an expressivist-friendly argument for abolitionism. One, a lot of people, and this, this, these are things that I think that uh, expressivists would actually accept. We feel values imposed on us obligations to be certain ways, act certain ways, and we're encouraged by the mode of discourse that we engage in to feel as if the world, in some sense, we can't put our finger on it, but somehow these obligations are just imposed, either by the world in some sense or by God, if we're talking about religious discourse. We're encouraged to feel that there's something outside of us that's doing the imposing, and it's not our culture. It's like normative reality, whatever, you know, you can't ever say really what it means. You've got to have these just holders. <laughs> or, or if you're Kant, and a, you build up an enormous metaphysical system to try to justify this sensibility. But uh, according to expressivists, you're not, you know, it's some combination of your psychology and culture that's doing these imposing. Now, again, I, this, there's nothing in expressivism that would that would be in conflict with the second thesis, that, well, that leads to some confusion about the nature of your relationship to yourself and, and to the world. Um, and it can promote attitudes that are impoverished uh, and disempowered. In fact, Blackburn talks about a defective, in earlier work, talks about how there's a certain kind of sensibility out there, and it's actually kind of common, according to Blackburn himself. And what's the sensibility? The sensibility is the following that you know, unless my reasons, my moral reasons, unless they're independent of my own attitudes, then they don't really matter that much. If it's just my attitudes, if it's just what I care about, then that just doesn't have the oomph I need to get motivated. And Blackburn calls that very sensibility I just described defective. But gee, Blackburn, I mean, doesn't realist discourse contribute to that sensibility? the very discourse that you're trying to mimic. Uh, 
very plausibly contributes to the sensibility that you find defective. So I'm just going to quote Joyce here, Richard Joyce. And by the way, this is somebody who defended the value of moral discourse. But he is pointing out here that it needs a defense. He says it's something of a travesty in moral philosophy that philosophers have just largely contented themselves with the unexamined assumption that morality, when he says morality, he means this particular feature of morality that we've been talking about, that that's a good thing without which we'd all be worse off. And you can see it happening with Prinz and lots of other uh, metaethical theories and the quasi-realists. We're just trying to, trying to get this attitude independence to work out. Or even if we're not trying to get attitude independence to work out, we're, we're ignoring the fact that moral discourse just has attitude independence kind of built into its functionality. But I think, I think we've got good reason to think that moral discourse does inhibit important forms of self-awareness. That's not only because of thou shalt. It's also because of, uh, I didn't talk about this, but a lot of the punitive reactive attitudes like anger and guilt and shame that are central to moral discourse. And I think standard approaches to metaethics, I've tried to, tried to give you some reasons to think that standard approaches to metaethics, including error theory even, unwittingly protect moral discourse from such critiques. Error theory protects it by presenting itself as necessary to get to these normative critiques. So you reject that, and you don't even have to worry about the critiques. And I think pragmatic naturalism provides a valuable methodology for evaluating moral and other concepts, especially if you do it with a healthy dose of skepticism. You don't just kind of assume they're super good and then look at, for their functions, <laughs> but be skeptical about them and then look for, the, look for the functions with some skepticism. I think it connects metaethical inquiry to cultural critique in an attractive way. Uh, and I also think just for independently investigating, like if asking the question, what are we doing with these concepts from a functional perspective is an independently interesting contribution to the project of self-awareness that um, has ancient roots in both Eastern and Western traditions. And that's a big part of what I'm trying to do. All right, thanks. That's it. Hello. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. So, yeah, I, I like the pragmatic naturalist approach, but basically if we are not going with error theory and we're also not realists about moral facts, what is to guide our conceptual engineering in this situation? Like, basically, when we're thinking about which concepts to adopt, um, what is the thou shalt, for example, in that situation? I mean, it seems like it might um, require at least some normative stances on things, unless you're simply going with a, uh, unless you're simply going basically off attitudes and cultural realities, in which case you might fall into the Hume problem of uh, deriving an is from an ought. Right. Thanks. Uh, so I would want to distinguish between normative considerations and thou shalt. So I don't think we need to have a thou shalt. Um, thou shalt is specifically referring to a certain kind of feeling that you've, that normativity or that what, how you ought to be, how you ought to do, um, is robustly independent of what your actual concerns are. So I think our, if we're going to have normativity at all, it's going to be tied up with some concerns of ours. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's just whatever the cultural reality is. You may have quite deep concerns. Uh, I'll just use concerns, by the way, to cover like values, even instincts, things like anything with a sort of directedness that has a kind of trying to do this or want to do this, um, even sort of maybe certain kinds of development. Um, but I think, so yeah, in any, any, any judgments to the effect that something is good or bad or right and wrong or we should do it, I think all those judgments, so I, to this extent, I agree with expressivists, that those, those are proceeding. Those judgments just, whatever the semantic story is, 
I don't care what the semantic story is. But as, from an explanatory point of view, I think those judgments do proceed from some aspects of our broadly motivational conative psychology. And so the first thing you asked was how, how do we, how do we, um, what guides us in the conceptual engineering? And that was, so one of the, the main thing that I argued, I don't think this is the only thing, but the function was supposed to do that. The function was supposed to give you some important information. It was it doesn't, so it, it doesn't fall afoul of Hume's dictum because even if you ascertain all of the functional information with 100% certainty, that would not entail what to do with the concepts. But it's going to give you information that feeds in to the things that you care about. That's going to give you, it's, so it's, I, the way I put it was it, gets, it gives you leverage on the questions. If I know what I'm doing with, with these concepts, that gives me important information to answer the question, do I want to keep using these concepts? Do I want to use different concepts? Do I want to maybe modify the concepts that I've got? And by the way, I'm a big fan of sort of looking elsewhere, too. We don't, the, way, the way that metaethics is presented is, uh, I was going to put one other, actually, I was going to put David Plunkett's conception of metaethics up here, but it's only so much time. Um, that was, and he, he said, look, we look at actual, at our actual ethical thought and talk, and we see how that fits into reality. But I don't, think, I don't think we ought to be focused just on our actual ethical thought and talk, because there's a lot of other traditions. There's a lot of ways we don't actually talk, but it might be worth talking in, whether it's Eastern traditions or religious traditions that you, what are, what are all these people doing? Maybe, maybe some of what, maybe those concepts could be really valuable for us. And I think one of the ways, but not the only ways, to see what, what, what are the concepts doing? What, what, what roles are they serving? Did that get at it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, so just quick pop it up. Um, Sam, thanks. That's awesome. I wonder Green? Uh, Splash. Uh, okay, so uh, I wanted to ask about the contribution of the naturalist part of your formula. Yeah. Seems okay. to me that naturalism is another disputable, disputable position and didn't seem, wasn't clear to me how it added to your critique. I mean, so, so my short version of the thought is uh, error theory is a big moat. You gotta mm. get people over error theory yeah. if you want to bridge to conceptual ethics. Yeah. Naturalism is a small moat because it's a certain kind of orthodoxy, but I think it's sort of widely thought that when people drill down to ask what's the content of naturalism and how do you police the boundaries and the stuff turns out to be something like, we bow a lot to what the methodology of the natural sciences tells us is available and relevant explanation. Suppose I just set that aside and said, here's what I want. Let's do use of whatever tools seem to be acceptable generally, whether we're naturalists or what, what, set aside the ideology of naturalism and say, we're looking at broadly speaking sociological debunking explanations or sociological explanations of what our concepts are doing. So we're yeah. pragmatists. Yeah. What are we doing? It seems like we can push this whole program and the naturalist part about whether I'm wedded to saying that the world contains roughly what a fairly unified vocabulary of science. You know, right. God knows what that turns out to be, right? right. I mean, naturalism yeah. is often poked as turning out to be toothless open-mindedness in the end. Why don't we just take the naturalism off and say, let's just go, let's not have to cross that moat either. Right, so there's, yeah. there's the, the kind of naturalism that I'm promoting is not metaphysical naturalism, yeah. right? So uh, the, the way that, the kind of naturalism I'm promoting, the pragmatic naturalism, is entirely consistent with saying that normative reasons are not part of the natural world, but they do exist. And in fact, I think that's, that's my own view. But it's not, it's not a robustly metaphysical view. It's just, if you look, if you need to posit normative reasons, to explain normative reason discourse, then that's a good reason for thinking that normative reasons are natural. I'm just getting this from you, Price, which I just I think he's right. Yeah. If you need to posit some, some entity or property to explain practice, then that's a good reason for considering that, that thing that you posited to be naturalistic because it's playing a role in causal, causal explanation. And so, um, but I, you know, if you don't need to posit it to explain natural things, then it's probably best just to not consider it non-naturalistic. But it's so metaphysically lightweight. It's not saying anything that ought to be 
controversial or ought to get your hackles up, like, what? You might as well be talking about witches. He's like, no, no, no. It's just, just literally, it's just a trivial consequence of what is or isn't needed to explain something. And as far as what is and isn't needed to explain something, the reason I, you know, I, I think the kinds of explanations that I think have the, by far the best chance of succeeding are ones that are broadly naturalistic. They, they are, they're broadly scientific explanations. That doesn't mean they have to be the ones that science currently says, but they're the kind of explanations that you could recognize as totally fitting into the scientific enterprise. And that's, that's yeah, really so if I, just, if I just said, uh, I'll just take an explanatory pragmatism, yeah. Right. Just set aside the whole question, like how do we police the boundaries of what counts as the natural? Yeah. We're just trying to get good, tractable explanations yeah. on how we yeah. use these concepts, and then that's going to turn out yeah. often to have stuff that raises self-awareness, yeah. and we're seeing where we're replicating ideologies that we might not sign up for, or where we're oppressed. Right. All these sort of even standing kind of Foucauldian scales from fall from your eyes when you look at things from a sure. different point of view. Yeah. And so I don't that the naturalism piece isn't something I need to buy to buy the rest of your package i, I mean i can I, see how like it's an it's a nice if you yeah, like naturalism sound, anyway you can fit it together with this it just didn't look like it was doing much to drive your if i'm understanding you right analysis. it wouldn't be so much that you're not buying it as a, as opposed to you don't think that the the term is really doing much work. yeah i didn't mean to say you're rejecting it. i was just thinking suppose i'm just neutral about what this dispute about naturalism yes is. i can still Take yeah. on board the, okay, the yeah. structure of critique. So, two, maybe if this is if I'm understanding yeah. you right, then you th are you thinking that so one of two possibilities. One is that naturalism just doesn't even denote anything, so it's just confusing to even put it in there. Another possibility is it does denote something, but namely whatever um, whatever the broadly scientific enterprise investigates, that's natural stuff. It does denote that, but why restrict our explanations to those kind a priori? Is that yeah. Okay, in that case, I don't want to restrict, I actually don't, so you, you make a good point that I, I wouldn't want to restrict them necessarily, but at the same time, from the point of view of a methodology, I do think those are the kind that you ought to be looking at. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, so, uh, wow, uh, it seems to be an incredibly complex problem to deal with, <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to you. Um, Am I right to say that the big difficulty behind a lot of it is that um, it kind of binds together value, which you say value, what value has this Nietzsche's problem, right? And, and then you say value to whom, right? And that is a can of worms without a bottom, right? Because it's just very complicated because then you go into the question of binding value and authority. Who is going to decide? what is right or what is wrong, you know, in a more universal way. Um, so you, you mentioned the kicking of the dogs, right? Well, you know, in some cultures, eating dogs is cool. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. So how do you pass, how can we ever hope, you know, to, to go beyond this sort of cultural polarization of right and wrong and value? Well, so uh, let's, since the question is a huge one as well, the project is big and so is that question. So I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things um, without pretending that there's any way I could possibly satisfactorily answer that question. Um, but the basic, there's two rough things I think is worth saying. One is that a lot of cultural disagreements might not be as deep as they seem to be. And a lot of, many people have written on this kind of topic, you know, like, um, it may be that the disagreement between, let's say, slave-owning societies and non-slave-owning societies isn't as deep as it seems. One reason to think so is that, um, and then you could just talk about our society at different times, right? Often there are um, non-normative, or at least beliefs that look non-normative, that are playing a kind of justifying role. So if you don't think that certain kinds of people are... If you, if you think that certain kinds of people are inherently inferior in certain ways, well, that goes and plays a role, whether it's a sufficient justification is a different question, but it's playing a role in justifying, let's say, slave practices. But that might, there might be beliefs about the basic potential of certain kinds of people that are just false. And so the disagreement is actually not fundamental. We, we could call it a non-fundamental normative disagreement. 
So if you could know certain things about humanity, about different races, then you might well lose the justifications that you yourself think you need. So when it comes to eating dogs, I'm not going to take a stand on whether it's right to eat dogs or not, because I don't, I don't, I don't, for, for, I don't know the answer for, for in a different cultural context. But that's another, another thing is to be, you know, um, a kind of do humility about whether you know what's right for other people. But it may turn out, it could turn out for all we know, that if you understood what was up with not only dogs but cows and pigs and other animals like that, if you knew the kinds of uh, things that they were capable of, whether emotionally, cognitively, that you yourself would find, well, gee, I don't think we should eat them. And so the disagreement may not be so fundamental. On the other hand, you may have fundamental disagreements. It could turn out that two different cultures or just two different kinds of people, um, whether they're culturally different or not, they may be genetically different or developmentally different, you could turn out to have fundamental disagreement. And if you have fundamental disagreement, then you have to figure out what to do about it. It doesn't automatically follow that just because we have fundamental disagreement, we have to go to war. Because we may also have some values about not killing people over fundamental disagreements. Depends on the nature of the disagreement. But it would be very valuable to investigate whether certain disagreements are fundamental or not. And if they are fundamental, then to try to figure out what to do about that. And I don't, the, the answer to that question will depend on the, on the case. If, if other people, if it turns out that some culture at the very deepest level just values certain kinds of torture and genocide and so on, then we may, maybe we should try to eliminate that culture. But that's, you just have, you have to see about what the, in the, in the case by case basis. Yeah, that's why religions put it on a supernatural level. You know, it's like God gives you the moral Could you value. use the mic? Yeah, that's, that's why religions, you know, brought this away, I guess, from the human plane to the supernatural. This is coming from above. It's yeah. beyond us. So there is, it's beyond value choices. Yeah. And that sort of settles the problem, you yeah. know, with the confusion that, of course, there are many different kinds of religions with different value systems. Yeah. But, but it's, it's kind of around that. It is really difficult, but it's very wonderful. Thank you. Actually, I, I hate to add one more complication, but given, given that I'm sort of Nietzschean, and ne there's also the issue of, you know, when you said up to us. So there's two, so there's two different things going. One is this kind of basic relativism that I've been suggesting, where all normativity is relative to our values. But then there's also this question of it being up to us. And that's not the same thing as relativism. If you imagine that you just have a certain set of values, well, they're not up to you. You just have them. But then there is also the question of what are you, what kind of things can we do both as individuals and, and groups to change our values? And I do think we can change our values. And so then there's a, an issue of self-creation coming up and be making it, it, the question of it being up to us what our values are raises a whole other level of compl dimension of complication. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Um, I had a question that was, it's maybe a little bit outside of the scope of what you were talking about, but definitely within concern. Um, and it is, why should we care about the commitments or why should we care about stability? And I'm asking this question in light of this idea that I, from my limited understanding of the Darwinian theories, of what the theories? Darwinian theories like Sharon Street, oh, which you yeah. sort of said yeah. you don't, support, and I'm wondering, um, to me it seems uh, sort of very plausible that ideas of stability and commitment are sort of feeding on uh, this Darwinian ideas, right? Um, yeah, that's the... So you're saying that um, the committing, the stabilizing function of moral concepts has a Darwinian explanation? Is that what you're suggesting? I'm suggesting that it's at least plausible. And oh. I'm curious why oh, I you think that's not the case. Oh, um, I do think that it, they, I, th I do think that they might have a Darwinian explanation as long as Darwinism is applied to culture. I think you can apply Darwinism to culture. I don't think that all cultural evolution is Darwinian, but I, to the extent that we're talking about selective forces, if, if that's what we mean by Dar Darwinism is some kind of selective process, then I do think those kind of selective processes apply at the level of 
cultural variants, but I don't think it's plausible that um, biological natural selection has done, I could be wrong, and I, maybe, it's maybe I think it's limited. I don't think it's plausible that um, at least the concepts that are articulated, these linguistic concepts, I think it's pretty implausible that those are the product of biological selection just because there hasn't been a, a lot of time for that to happen. In, but I could be wrong. I think what's more plausible is that what Nietzsche talked about, that phrase, thou shalt, there's a, there's a, a basic sensibility which is unarticulated, or at least pre-articulated. That, is, I think, is more plausibly, more plausibly a product of biological selection because it, it, it's, it's at least it's prior to language, presumably. Then just quickly to add up uh, to that, um, it seems like sort of the main concern with the Darwinian theories is that should there be some kind of biological Darwinian explanation, then that really undermines our idea of like morality, right? And so it, it sort of like defeats the purpose of the project of all kinds of moral investigation, including mm. what you're trying to do. Mm. Oh, including what I'm trying to do? I mean, I think all kinds of morality, because there's no such thing necessarily as, and I might be wrong, I might not be understanding yeah. that as well, but like it seems to me like it is sort of this ultimate like error theory, saying that there's no such thing as morality, period. Yeah, good. So, um, I mean, it's not the only reason, but a big part of what has got me going the direction that I have been going for some time now just is broadly Darwinian considerations. So the idea that whether through biological selection or cultural selection, um, some combination of those things is going to explain somewhere between almost all and all of my broadly moral and ethical sensibilities. Okay, I get that. And so I think it's a very big mistake to build a conception, to, to, to go around operating on a conception of ethics that requires that that kind of explanation not be correct, because that kind of explanation probably is correct. So what I want to do is recognize that the sheer fact that, if it is a fact, the sheer fact that my profound concern for my brother's welfare or my niece's welfare, if you told me that all that is going to get explained in terms of biological and cultural selective forces, I'm going to say, OK, no problem. Okay. The concern, I still care the same. All right, thank you. Yeah. Oh, you want, yeah. Yeah, but two more on the list, and then Susan, so we're short on time, so okay. we could um, go uh, directly. So I'm next. Okay, I uh, thanks. I wanted to ask about the. I think you called it the expressivist master argument. Yeah. Um, so broadly, it was um, according to error theory, beliefs about the nature of normativity or non-normative. Yeah. Error theory is confused about that. Therefore, there's nothing illegitimate in ordinary thought and practice. OK, yeah. Um, so I wondered if that was uncharitable, if, um, if what Blackburn or someone else would mean in the final claim there is there's nothing illegitimate of the sort that the error theorist wanted to say was illegitimate yeah. right. in ordinary practice and thought. And then, and then I was thinking maybe the deeper mistake that this school is making, according to you, is that they want to say that the, the hard work of figuring out whether there is something illegitimate about um, your caring deeply for your brother is going to always be properly understood as something that at its base is conative, <laughs> whereas yeah. you want to say um, at least part of it, and maybe the most important part, is going to be an essentially cognitive project where we're looking at, we're trying to gather true beliefs about the functions that these are actually playing in our practices, and perhaps also historical accounts of how you came to have those values. And it, I guess my thought is that that would be helpful for, t for you um, because uh, because 
as you presented it, this is a this is a mistaken argument. But then, but then the expressivist could say, yeah, but I, I'm not going to make that mistake. And right. uh, and you have a deeper beef with the with the expressivist, and it seems it seems plausible for you to say. Um, why assume that all of this is going to be just expressing um, my cognitive attitudes um, as opposed to actually, a cog- at least in part, a cognitive project of trying to figure out what functions these, these things are actually playing? Okay, let me see if, uh, tell me if I got this right. It seems like there's a couple, a couple of things going on there. I'll try to take them in turn. One is this may not be charitable to the expressivist. And... Um, I can, I can totally see why that might seem to be right. The, only, well, the reason I would say that they can't quite make that move that you suggested, which is that that is what they mean. You're right, that they do mean there's nothing metaphysically illegitimate, but that's the only kind of legitimacy that they're, that's the only kind of problem that they're even acknowledging as a potential problem. So there's the, 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 only, kind of, the only kind of legitimacy that even could be at issue on their own understanding just is normative legitimacy. So the idea, now, so here, here's a way of seeing why I don't think that it was, it's uncharitable. If they thought that, if they recognized, look, yeah, there's no metaphysical illegitimacy, but the now what question is still totally live, they would have said so at some point. They would have said, in a footnote somewhere, we realize that our view raises the now what question just as much as error theory, and you know we're not going to argue for it or whatever. There's nothing like that anywhere. Just acknowledging that we recognize that the now what question or abolitionism is a possibility on our view. There's not even so much as that recognition. So I think what's happened is they've confused metaphysical objections with the only kind of objections, even though on their own view, metaphysical objections just have to be understood as normative objections. So my, you know, I, I sent a paper making, it wasn't this same paper, but it was a similar paper. I sent it to Blackburn and Gibbard recently, and it wasn't, it, it yeah, they didn't say that. And was, uh, that's, that's maybe not very valuable, but what's more valuable is just that the claim that if this was being, if this was, if they were, if this was interpreted uh, the way that you were suggesting, then at some point somewhere they should have acknowledged that there's this whole other normative question, which our view not only allows to be raised but entails that the the only way to defend metaphysical beliefs is in normative terms, and therefore abolitionism has got, certainly got to be on the table. We we rec- we recognize that at least at some point we ought to engage with abolitionist arguments, but there's nothing like that anywhere. And secondly, I think you might have been drawing a contrast between the, this deeper conflict that you were pointing to. Um, I'm not sure that there is that conflict. So my, the way that you're saying that they, have a, they would evaluate normative judgments in broadly conative terms, is that, so, so, they are, so normative judgments just are conative judgments for them. And then, so if, if you're somebody like Blackburn, or if you are, in fact, Blackburn, um, then you think, how do you evaluate normative progress? Well, you can only do it by reference to other conative attitudes. That's the whole, so it's a, there's a kind of coherentism. There's a kind of, look, if I make a normative judgment, and suppose it's insensitive in some sense, well, I might value sensitivity in my normative judgments. And so if I made a different normative judgment that was more sensitive, then by my own lights, that might be a superior normative judgment. I don't have any beef with that. My, the kind of cognitivism that you were uh, attributing to me is aimed at, at the level of investigating the function of concepts, but not, it wasn't uh, aimed at the level of evaluating first order moral or normative judgments. There, I think, at least, at least to a first approximation, I think that Blackburn is basically right. I just think that if that's how you think about normative progress, why not just do that more transparently? Why talk in terms of attitude-independent normative facts if your own view is that the way that you evaluate normative progress is by appeal to your own sentiments, by, to your own values? I value sensitivity. I value informativeness. I value being informed. 
If my normative judgment's uninformed, then by my own life, that's a problem. Why can't we just talk that way? Why are we talking about moral facts that are independent of all of our attitudes? That just seems to be, that seems to be really in conflict with the insight of expressivism itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. I think you've already started to answer my question, which was, um, so I take it you're advocating that even on a quasi-realist view, there's space for this uh, abolitionist uh, critique or like reevaluation of normative and moral discourse. And so I, I, so I totally understand what that would look like if you were an error theorist about morality, but not about practical reasons or prudence, because then here's a standard by which we can evaluate our moral discourse uh, is, is it good for us? Is it healthy? Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted, I really I was just uh, kind of confused about what this uh, evaluative project would look like for a quasi-realist. Like, but by which standard would they evaluate their normative discourse? Evaluate moral discourse? Yeah. Oh, so I, I was trying to give one standard by which they might evaluate moral discourse and by which they might negatively evaluate it. I think it flies in the face of the very kind of methodology, for lack of a better term, but the very kind of process by which Blackburn himself suggests that we evaluate normative progress. How do we evaluate normative progress? By appeal to our own values. So if, we, if I make a normative judgment that's insensitive, that could be inferior to a normative judgment that's more sensitive. But there's no suggestion that sensitivity is some kind of value that you simply just have to have, no matter what your values are. So there's, there's a kind of schizo... In fact, quasi-realism has been accused of, of schizophrenia. I don't, but I think in a confused way. I think that it's, they, people have accused quasi-realism as being literally inconsistent. Why is that? Because as an expressivist, I say, um, Normative judgments are expressions of practical attitudes. As a quasi-realist, I say normative judgments are in, normative facts are independent of all attitudes. That looks inconsistent to a lot of people, but it's not inconsistent. But it, even though it's not inconsistent, it's really intention. The one way of talking where I say normative truths are totally independent of any of my attitudes, I think the more that you really think that way, the more you lose sight of the expressivist insight itself, the more that you lose sight of the fact that these are expressions of practical attitudes. I'm a little concerned I'm not necessarily getting at your question, though. Am I? No, I, I think you are. But I mean, so I think the, the passage which I was um, kind of confused by, I, I wrote it down, which was you said something like, uh, quasi-realists have worked so hard to earn the right to talk like realists that they have little consideration to whether they ought to do so. Yeah. And I was just yeah, wondering um, what this project would look like for a quasi-realist. So I okay. talked about what it would look like for a, an error theorist. Yes. I was just wondering if you could expand. Yeah, on yeah. That. So yeah, so I, I, think, I hope I was addressing yeah. it then. I think, I think the ins when I call the expressivist insight, let's assume it's true, so it's, so it's an insight, um, that when we make moral judgments, we're expressing conative attitudes, practical attitudes. Um, that insight, I think, gets obscured the more that we talk as if moral facts are totally independent of our attitudes. I think it's worth recognizing. I think it's worth building into. And I think even I think an expressivist should be able to see this. I think they probably could. I don't. I, I mean, I have. I'm wishful thinking. I think like if I just could just, come on, expressivists, just look, you know. Why not talk in terms of the very things that by your own account is generating the judgments and the very things by reference to which we can judge certain normative judgments to be superior or inferior to other ones, namely the kinds of things that you yourselves value in normative judgments, whether it's informativeness or sensitivity or whatever it might be. Um, we could just talk far more transparently in terms of, I don't think transparency is the only virtue, but it's, I think it's, it's, I guess it's an important one. Um, I think that would, it would help us be far more aware of the kinds of things that we're trying to do, which often are in bad faith. <laughs>
not all, not everybody in this room excluded, of course, <laughs> but some people sometimes make real highfalutin, self-righteous arguments, moral arguments about what has to be done, and this just must be the case. And there's no recognition that ultimately this is coming from our own values. And I think that could help with cultural disagreements, that why don't we at least just start with, with the recognition that we've, the way that we, like, like I quoted Prince there, that we have contingent moralized sentiments. And that's a starting point. How do we figure out what we ultimately care about um, and, what, and what we should care about? I think, I think the question of what you should care about is a completely legitimate and necessary question. But ultimately, that question can only be answered by reference to some things that you care about. That's my, and I think that should be what an expressivist should say. But I think they're kind of, there's a kind of schizophrenia. An expressivist has got to want to say something like that. But on the other hand, as soon as you start talking about moral truths being attitude independent, well, what? I thought you just, I thought this was your view. So I, th I think they really shouldn't, I think there's just, the travesty <laughs> is that there's just this unexamined assumption that if you, so here's the, here's, the, here's the extent to which I was technically maybe almost a little slightly wrong in what I said to you when they, they haven't defended quasi-realism or realist discourse um, on normative grounds. That wasn't as technically not correct. Black, Blackburn has a footnote that says thinking that the wrongness of kicking dogs is, um, depends on your own attitudes is not nice, full stop, as far as defending realist discourse. There's a footnote in some place that says rel relativism is not nice. I think, you know, you could do a lot better. Than, you, need to, you need to do a lot more than that. So a quasi-realist could, like, recommend getting rid of, like, talk of moral obligation uh, uh, <laughs> be uh, because um, it's bad for, you know, it, it's, it's deflective or something. Like, they could yeah. adopt your theory and say this it, is my it, 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 gener it, it um, well, that's not the slide. It, I think there's good reason to think it promotes exactly the kind of so-called defective sensibility that Blackburn talks about in other areas. And I think it inhibits awareness of the, of, of the expressivist insight itself and of the basic kind of methodology by which expressivists themselves think we can judge the superiority or inferiority of certain normative judgments, namely by reference to values that we have with respect to our normative judgments. Yeah. Values say that we should go normal and achieve it over time. But they also say, more importantly, that we should thank our speakers for an excellent discussion and talk. Thank you.